So as you will see, we are recording this so that people can come back later and watch it. We do recognize that seven o'clock is not the easiest time always for parents, depending on your children's routines and things. Um, so yeah, we know there will be some people who might want to watch it later, but aren't able to come along at the live time. But it looks like we've got people here, so we will kick off. So um, kia ora koutou and welcome to our Let's Get Local panel webinar. Um, I'm Jen, I am from New Plymouth, Ngamotu, but I am coming here today from Wellington actually. I've been involved with Parents for Climate Aotearoa for the last year or so and most recently that has been leading our Let's Get Local campaign. So this campaign, which you've probably seen some of if you've made it along here tonight, but if you haven't, we are sort of running a campaign encouraging parents and families to learn about local government, to vote in the elections, which are coming up very soon, and to have their say on local issues and community, community things that concern them in ways that suit them, I suppose. Uh, so far, the campaign has covered what different local organ local government organizations do, a bit about how local decision making works, and yeah, a bit about why we should care about local government. And the next topic we're just sort of coming up to is what being a counselor involves and what the skills or what skills and attributes people might need to do it well. Um, so that's where this webinar really fits into the campaign. Later on in the campaign, we'll be looking at how else we as individuals not in a council can engage with local government, how we might sort of choose what to speak up on and how we can involve our kids in local decision making and also a bit about talking, talking to friends and family about local issues because some of those issues that do come up can get a little bit contentious I suppose. Um, Tonight for this webinar, we're not looking at sort of those contentious local issues. We're mostly focusing on the experience of our amazing panelists. Um, and yeah, if you're interested in the campaign, we hope you'll jump onto our Facebook page, Instagram, or check out our website, which has all the information on there. So yeah, have a look at that. Um, where are we? On our call today, we also have our national coordinators, Alicia and Olivia, who will be helping with the tech in the background and also have helping with the question and answer section that will be the end of the webinar. Um, as we chat with our panelists, just use the chat function to pop your questions in, things that come up when you're hearing them speak. Um, and then, of course, we have our seven amazing councillors and candidates that make up our panel. So this evening, they're here to help us learn about what's involved with running for and then sitting on a council or community board. So a huge warm welcome and a big thank you to Rebecca, Julie, Jill, Amanda, Sophie, Elvisa and Luana for all making the time to be here tonight. Uh, we really appreciate it and we are super excited to hear what you have to share with us. Uh, so as you've probably seen from the panelists' information and you'll find out in their introductions in a couple of minutes. We do have panelists from different councils, different areas of the country. And so the focus of this webinar really isn't on local issues, campaigning, things like that. It's about helping us all to get just some different, ex different perspectives on the role of a councillor. So it might inspire some of our attendees to stand next time or possibly just help you to work out what candidates in your own area might be well suited for the task of councillor. So to kick us off this evening, we're going to give each of our panelists a chance to introduce themselves and to let everyone know where they're from, where they are in their council journey, I suppose, and what led them to wanting, be, wanting to be involved in local governance. So I think panelists, you should all have your like run order for the introductions there. So feel free to just jump in once the person ahead of you finishes their introduction. And then we'll get into the sort of crux of the discussion. So first up, we have Sophie. Yeah, kia ora koutou. Um, ko Sophie toko ingoa, uh, no inga rangi a hau, no um, tofarakakato toko kainga inai nei. Uh, so my name is Sophie McInnes. Um, I'm originally from England, in case you couldn't tell from the accent. Um, 
And I live in Rolleston, which is in Selwyn, um, also known as Waikirikiri, uh, just outside of Christchurch. And um, yeah, so I've got my list of things to say. Can you see or hear me? <laughs> Sorry, thank you. Dodgy webcam. Yeah, so um, about I'm a first term councillor at the moment, hopefully going to come back again. We'll see. It's up to somebody else. Um, but yeah, so I decided to run three years ago because my I had twins basically th uh, three years before that. And so I'd spent three years essentially at home as a stay at home mum doing lots of voluntary work and just doing stuff around the community and having an awful lot of time to think while dealing with babies and getting frustrated with, you know, walking around with a buggy and all that sort of stuff and thinking, well, instead of going back to something like my old job, which was actually as a school secretary, um, let's try and do something that makes me feel a bit more fulfilled and like I'm actually trying to do something better for my kids, basically. So we gave it a go and I managed to get in by 13 whole votes <laughs> and I'm quite glad. <laughs> I'm actually really enjoying it. Like it frustrates me no end at various points, but it makes your brain work. You learn things, you get to put forward different perspective. Um, there are a few dads with young kids on our council, but overall we are a very pale, male and stale area uh, in council, but uh, district has an average age of about 37, I think at the moment. Um, and it's growing very quickly, mostly with the younger families. So, so that's me. I just basically want to do it for the kids. But yeah. Kia ora koutou, ko Rebecca Matthews, toko ingoa. Uh, I'm a Wellington City Councillor. Um, I am a first-term councillor for the Farangi Onslow Western Ward um, and standing again. I don't know why, but I am. And um, I, I guess I stood for council really because I was asked and I was asked a couple of times and the most recent time I was asked I guess I was kind of feeling like what am I doing with my life and that may not be the best reason to to run for council but I was feeling like I'm a middle-aged woman in my workplace and I don't seem to be in a leadership role and what am I going to do and I'm invisible and so oh, maybe I'll try this and I won't get in but I'll see it might create some other opportunities and um, because of, of, of various things I did get in and um, it's actually really ignited passion for me about cities and um, particularly around the issues of, of housing, transport, climate change. It's um, I've become sort of a, you know, budding urbanist. Um, I also, I guess, became, I was someone who didn't know about local government, but I got involved through the living wage campaign. And that was how I first interacted with city councillors was going to talk to them about the living wage. I'm actually wearing my living wage t-shirt because um, our apprentice gardeners, we just moved to a living wage um, and we went to celebrate and have cake with them today. And I guess the other thing that I wanted to mention in this introduction is I didn't know if council was for me because I am a renter and I had moved around a lot. And so the kind of whole ward based system seemed weird because I didn't really have deep roots in one community because I had lived in so many different ones. Um, and I, I guess one thing that's changed that is we've got a sort of decent long-term leases. We've kind of had two years, two years, two years um, where we are now in Nile. And that, um, while I still don't consider myself like deeply local, like some people are, because, you know, we I haven't sort of spent a whole, um, I'm not, you know, deeply embedded in the community like some, uh, some are. Um, that's made it easier and I've seen it more for me um, because I've got to stay in, in one place for a bit longer. So yeah, looking forward to hearing from everybody else. Uh, kia ora, uh, ko Julie Ferry tuku ingoa, uh, te hia mana o te poari, hapore o pukitāpapa mau te kaunihira arohe o Tamaki Makauro. Uh, so I'm Julie Ferry, I'm the chair at the moment of the Pukitāpapa Local Board, um, which is part of Auckland Council. Uh, we have a bit of a different structure in Auckland uh, where we have the regional council, um, but they also have some of the sort of city and district council functions and then we have local boards, which um, are kind of like super community boards. Um, and uh, I am currently running for the councillor position um, for my ward area, but I've just done 12, 12 years on the local board. 
um, which is a full-time role in your chair uh, or a part-time role if you're not. Um, but, uh, yeah, so um, Pukitabapa is basically Mount Roskill. Uh, so uh, we cover um, a really diverse community, 50% born outside New Zealand. Um, we have, I think, the highest uh, percentage of Muslim population as well. Um, but historically, it's been a very um, Christian-focused sort of Bible Belt um, suburban area. Um, so lots of interesting challenges with all of that. Um, we've had several waves of settlement that um, can also be a challenge in terms of um, we haven't historically had relationships with mana whenua, um, and so that's something that we've been really focused on building because um, we have no local marae. Um, we're quite a contentious area where we have come and gone over history. Um, and then we have uh, Pākehā settlers. We have um, a wave of state housing that came through in the 50s and 60s, of which um, my grandparents were part of. Um, and now... Um, and then in the 80s, lots of Pacifica people. Um, and now we've been a, um, a resettlement point for a lot of refugees um, and still welcome many, many migrants. We do local citizenship ceremonies and stuff. So um, I first got involved um, completely by accident. Uh, so I stood for election in 2010 on a ticket that uh, my husband was putting together. Um, that was the progressive ticket, the Labour Greens type ticket in the area. They had a woman pull out at the last minute and uh, needed another woman. I was on maternity leave from my union job, um, pregnant with our second child, and said, sure, you can use me. Uh, and I'm like photoshopped into the side of all of the um, materials and stuff and look quite different because I was eight months pregnant. And uh, surprisingly, um, my husband and I won, uh, which was a bit awkward because I had literally just had a baby um, by the time we got to election day. So um, I guess in a way it was fortunate that it was both of us because that meant there were two parents there um, to handle the, the newborn baby. Uh, and we had a um, nearly three-year-old. Since then, um, I've had another baby while I was on the board. Um, he's now seven, um, but he arrived uh, 10 weeks prem. So that was another really interesting challenge. Um, yeah, so really looking forward to the conversation. Have to say, um, the first time was by accident. The next three were not accidental. I, I really love and enjoy this work. Um, and this time, if I'm successful, will definitely not be an accident. So, kia ora. Oh, kia ora koutou, uh, ko Jill Day to ko ingoa, um, he uri ahau no Ngati Tuwhare Toa, uh, me te puaki au, uh, kei te papo i oia, uh, me o tautahi, uh, me te whanganui a tara, um, e noho ana au, um, kei te whanganui a tara e naia nei. Um, he kai koni hira a ho uponiki. Uh, so I'm Jill Day. Um, I fuck up papa to Tufaretu, which is in the central North Island um, from Turangi. Um, but as you heard, I grew up in, I was born in Palmerston North, lived in Christchurch, and then um, settled in Wellington when I was 14. So Wellington has been my home for much of my life. Um, and I'm currently a councillor on Wellington City Council. This is my second term. Um, and I've decided not to stand again for Wellington City Council, which was a, a difficult decision, but I do believe change is good, and the more people that get the opportunity to sit at council table, the better it is for our communities, so it felt right for me at this time, um, but I have actually decided to stand for our local community board um, to keep um, active, and also we had lots of people standing down, and it's been a really effective board, so I decided that there was an opportunity that I could still keep contributing, um, but you'll also be aware that um, uh, I'm from what I, my introduction that um, being Māori um, but not being mana whenua in an area has been a, a big part of my journey um, on council and that's partly played a role in why I'm not standing again because um, we've been pretty um, proactive uh, this term in improving our relationship with mana whenua. Um, we have seats at the table for mana whenua and um, our Māori ward and I feel that at this point in time it's quite important for me to step aside as someone who's advocated for Māori as Māori um, to make that space for mana whenua. Um, so what attracted me to stand for council? Well I really actually didn't know much about councils. I had I had voted in quite a few elections but I realise now I didn't really know what I was voting for. I needed this webinar uh, much earlier in my life. So I want to do a big um, acknowledgement to, um, to you for putting this together so that people can try and um, grapple with what it is that we're electing people to do. Um, so I was shoulder tapped um, like Councillor Matthews um, and I uh, 
I actually had to go home and Google what does a city councillor do. Now, if you do that, you, it'd be amazing for you to see what comes up. You get all sorts of funny headlines, and um, it's actually amazing that I agreed to do it after reading that. But um, I, at the same time that I was um, shoulder tapped, we were having some issues. Um, I'm a school teacher, and some of the children I was teaching were having quite significant issues around their housing, and it was really where we were starting to see the, the housing crisis really step up to that next level. So I was sort of confronted with this opportunity and a problem at the same time and kind of went, well, maybe. Maybe there's, a, maybe there's something that I could do to be a voice for, particularly for young people who often don't get much of a, a voice when it comes to the decisions that we make that have huge impact on them. Um, and so we, um, so I was elected a bit like others, didn't expect it to necessarily happen, and it did. Um, and then obviously 2019, we had a very different election where we had some surprising results, which were quite challenging. But the, the amazing surprise that we had, which was pretty exciting, is we had 11 women elected out of 15. So four men, 11 women. And um, that's been a really awesome journey, being with so many amazing clever, intelligent wahine who, um, you know, many have children um, and are very focused on the future and on how we're addressing issues like climate change. So an amazing journey and I'm really looking forward to hearing from all of our panellists and um, hearing the questions that come up too. Kia ora. Kia ora. I think it's my turn. <laughs> um, uh, no airangi, no piripaina o ku tūpona, no tokoroa hau, ko taranaki tōku kāinga, ko Alvisa van der Leiden tōku ingoa. Um, thanks for inviting me to be part of this. This is so exciting. Um, and you'll find out why as I sort of work my way through my bullet points. Um, so I'm a volunteer trustee and chair of um, a startup organisation, community creative um, taranaki, um, which is a grassroots um, arts community organization that I've helped develop right through to where it is now and we're about to hire our first regional arts coordinator so I've been involved in that I'm a committee member on the Namotu Marine Reserve Society and I used to be the contract environmental educator founder of Taranaki Youth Voice and a general environmental volunteer so whenever I find time and there's like a planting or a beach clean going on I'll be there um, but being a counsellor for the, my first term over the last three years has actually given me um, some freedom and time for these roles um, before I started working for Forest and Bird earlier this year. Um, I got involved in local government through my union <laughs> and the PSA where we had a youth hui in Wellington um, in 2019, literally just before nominations closed and I hadn't even thought about standing for local government but um, incredibly our spokes uh, our um, keynote speaker was Chloe Swarbrick and so I just wanted to talk to her I wanted an excuse to be like yeah I've spoken to Chloe um, so I asked a question put my hand up in the forum and I asked a question what uh, advice would you give a young environmentalist looking to stand for local government in an oil and gas and farming region and everyone was like "Ooh, that's a really good question um and I can't even remember what she said I was just I just remember feeling like oh apparently that was a good question to ask um and it just so happened that I ended up sharing a cab with her to the airport after the hui and and she ended up coming down to support my campaign um so I just kind of fangirled and got onto council <laughs> in a nutshell <laughs> um but yeah like seriously it was it wasn't something that I had seriously considered until I'd seen other young people standing for local government and realizing that oh we do have the capacity we do have the right um and we do have a massive support base to help us get into these roles um so that's what inspired me um and so now I'm finishing up my first term on Taranaki Regional Council. Um, I feel like I, what helped me get on was my media education and, and environmental science background, which kind of gave me a little bit of credibility. But also I already had those community networks from my um, contract work. And being the youngest Taranaki Regional Councillor at 28 years old, if you look at the photo of our council, um, I look like the adopted grandchild from overseas um it's not very diverse <laughs> and 
so it's been a real honor to sort of be a bit more of a progressive voice in that space. Um, and it, it's been an honor to be described as an ally to iwi reps in mana whenua as I, did, you know, as I feel like I'm tanga to tiriti, so I've been able to sort of strengthen those relationships as well. I'm one of two women on the council, and there's always been either one or two women, so hoping for at least three or four or a full council of women, maybe, as there are... Um, 2,000 more females and males in the New Plymouth constituency, Namotu, where I'm standing. Um, and so that would be really great to be able to actually reflect what the community looks like. Um, so now I'm currently 31 and happy with my first child, which, you know, trying to save money and campaign at the same time, it's really difficult. Um, whereas before I was, you know, I had a bit of savings and flexibility and no child to sort of consider. So it's been a really different journey this campaign season for me. Um, and yeah, really excited to see what else we can talk about in this corridor. Thanks. Uh, kia ora tato, ko Luana Scowcroft tēnei. Um, I am calling in tonight from the Mighty Fataitai here in Pōneke, Tranganui Atara. Um, I'm not on council. <laughs> I think I'm the odd one out here. Uh, I'm trying to be. So um, I'm running my first ever uh, campaign where I'm the candidate, which feels pretty weird and pretty different uh, to past campaigns that I've supported from the background. Um, look, first of all, I just a big mahi to Rebecca and Jill here, um, you know, and uh, the other amazing woman on council because actually seeing people that look like me and have similar life experiences was genuinely one of the reasons that I was like, actually, I can definitely do this. So just, you know, we don't say that to each other enough. So massive mihi to both of you. Um, so I'm come from the beautiful Cook Islands. Um, my parents and grandparents uh, were there. My children, I guess, are fourth generation Papa A Cook Island. Um, but I was raised by my incredible um, Mama Ina, who's an Indigenous Cook Islander. So I guess my worldview largely is made up of, um, of what I've learnt from my Cook Islands upbringing. Um, and really that's around everyone thriving, not just a few of us. So that's really kind of been one of the main drivers for me. The other one is that I'm a mama. Um, I've got two, two little pepe. I've got um, Freya Waimari and Evie Mahina, who are three and six. So that's been a really interesting ride um, campaigning. So um, good luck to the next time round for you, Elvisa. Um, it's been an interesting time. And look, I've tried to involve them at every possible step, and especially my six-year-old really gets it. You know, we talk about when we've talked about politics more generally and in the general election, I brought her to vote with me and we talked about, um, you know, voting in the parties and voting in Jacinda at the time and talking about how she's the boss of New Zealand, but also New Zealand's the boss of her. And she really gets that concept. And so when we talk about me running for council, she's really like, yeah, you want to be one of the bosses of Wellington. I'm like, and <laughs> Wellington's going to be the boss of me. Um, so that's been really cool. And, you know, I, I asked her, I was trying to come up with a campaign slogan and for my t-shirts. And I was like, why do you think I want to be a counselor? And Evie said, oh, it's because you want to take care of Wellington. And that to me, I actually, you know, I had all these really clever political people who are probably going to watch this and go, hey, um, you know, we would, brainstorming for weeks trying to come up with something that really felt authentic and really real and actually my six-year-old did it for me and I think that kind of encapsulates my my main reason um, for running I feel like I have a responsibility as a parent to ensure that this place is thriving well into their future um, you know back home in the cooks I've been on the front line of climate change for more than a decade now and you know seeing it play out here in, in Wellington I mean right now with the weather in a very real way uh, you know, I feel like I have I have something to give, and it's it's my time to to give back to the city that I love, and that has helped me raise my babies as well. Um, what else do I have to say? I think that's kind of it. Um, yeah, just looking forward to the corridor, and um, oh, have I, I haven't said where I'm running. I'm here running here in Mutsukairangi, which is the eastern ward uh, in Wellington. I'm in the Green Party candidate for for our area. So um, yeah, kia ora, that's me.
Kia ora koutou. Um, ko Ingerihi me Airehi me um, Wirihi te Whakapapa, ko Slains Castle te Waka, um, i tipu o i, um, i te maru o Maunga Kiki, i te taha o um, te Waitama, Waitamata, um, ko uh, Ngā Motu Te Painga a nai nei, ko Amanda Clinton go to Stoko Ingoa. Kia ora uh, everyone, lovely to be here this morning and I feel so uplifted and inspired hearing and the introductions of all of these amazing uh, women on the panel. It's so awesome. Um, and I'm looking forward to hearing from others of you that are sitting kind of watching the panel too. Um, so I am coming to the end of my first term as a councillor on the New Plymouth District Council. Um, and also have decided after quite a long deliberation period, I have to say, um, to stand again for council. Um, why did I stand for council? Um, I have a background in law and science, so I'm a former lawyer, studied science as well. Um, and through the law piece, I've always been interested, not really in how to apply the law, but more about law and policy and how law and policy shapes the communities and the world that we live in. And so I've always been a bit of a politics geek, but always from the sidelines of like listening to a lot of radio New Zealand and watching news and you know rummaging through articles about politicians and policy and whatnot um, and I guess I never really thought of being involved in local government politics at all um, certainly not under the age of 65 because I'd never seen anyone under the age of 65 <laughs> serving on council and probably no women at that point really either or well, not many um, and so it hadn't really been in my realm of consideration or possibility at that kind of local government level. And then um, about six months before the election last uh, term, I went to a hui and heard from a woman named Jenny Rowan, who used to be um, the mayor of Inglewood back in the 80s and then had a time as um, mayor of Kapiti. Formidable woman, she's amazing. Um, and she did a corridor at this hui. She had just come back from um, the climate change and consciousness um, conference that had been held uh, in Scotland um, about six months before that. So we're talking like four years ago, if anyone's familiar with that one. Anyway, she came back and she was really like passionate about climate change and the fact that actually we really have to act now. And so she issued a a whittle to all of the people with that hui to say you need to do something about climate change you personally like this is not a nebulous us like you personally need to do something and in six months time you're having an election you know a local government election and I challenge all of you to do something about it like ask the candidates questions um you know think about running pressure, pressure the council whatever way you can and so I was like I, okay I could Pressure the council, yep, sure. And when I did a deputation and to the audit and risk committee and told them that they didn't have climate change properly considered in their risk register and um, kind of looked around the table and thought, I think I could do this job actually, maybe better than some of the people currently around the table. Um, and to my surprise, they were about to tick and flick this policy um, and they ended up having this really robust debate about it. Um, it still passed about eight to seven, so pretty narrowly. Um, and it yeah, landed for me that maybe it was something I, I could do, but I sort of thought I was still a bit delusional. And then a couple of weeks after that, I went to a, another um, community meeting where um, this amazing Native American woman spoke and uh, she told a, a story that I won't do justice by repeating but she asked the audience a question and she said she asked us two questions actually the first was what kind of ancestor were your ancestors hoping you would be and what kind of ancestor do you want to be and I went oh shit I think I have to run for council um and so yeah that was really um why I decided to stand because uh, predominantly, it was the issue of climate change and seeing that, you know, our council in Ngamotu, New Plymouth, really hadn't had it on the radar as something that needed doing at all, needed responding to, and I didn't really think that was good enough, um, particularly for the future generations. 
Um, and at that point, I wasn't a parent. Um, but this term, I have become a parent. So I have a 16-month-old um, boy, um, uh, which has, you know, children come with all kinds of challenges. Um, and it's been a real juggle uh, over the last uh, 16 months um, being a parent and a counsellor. And I think the thing that stands out for me the most, actually, it's become more difficult because the importance of every decision we make is that much more visceral for me and the decisions that you feel like go the wrong way it is all the more frustrating because I see that we're not doing it for the next generation and I come home and look at my little boy and be like I'm really sorry dude um so yeah I think that's me it's great to be here I'm looking forward to the conversation can I talk Amazing. Thank you so much to all our panel. Um, I, it was just wonderful to hear such a range of experiences from such a like diverse and amazing group of women here. So I feel very lucky to be here having this conversation with you all tonight. Um, so for the next section, we're hoping to have quite an open conversation. Um, rather than sort of me chucking out questions, everyone answering them, just hoping it will flow a bit more naturally. I do have some questions to keep us going if we need to, um, but also just to all the panellists, if you guys use the hands up feature, if someone says something or a question pops up that you want to answer, we'll try and just move through. Um, so do be aware of us wanting to sort of give everyone a bit of a chance. I'm just going to check. Sophie, are you still here? Because I know you... What time did you have to leave? Um, I need to leave around about eight. Okay, cool. Uh, that will Apologies, everybody is a residence association meeting in my area. <laughs> Highly exciting. Cool. No, I just wanted to check in on that to make sure you would get to be in some of this conversation. I'm glad to hear that we've still got 25 minutes ish more left with that. Um, so to get the conversation started, perhaps someone would be willing to kick us off by talking a bit about what it means as a woman and a parent to stand for council and how this has influenced your mahi in local government. So I'm just going to change to the right view. We got any hands up on that one? Elvisa, go for it. Sorry, I used the, the wrong hand signal, but it's the right color. <laughs> it works. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess just to start the conversation going um, and to sort of echo what Young Elected Members Network um, has been talking a lot about, um, seeing as half of us are sort of going through similar phases in life, starting our families, um, building our lives, um, making mokopuna decisions and not accepting business as usual, which tends to be the running theme when you come in as a minority and realize that, you know, I think some, some of the more seasoned, um, yeah, uh, dominant demographic, pale stale male, <laughs> I might as well say it, um, you know, they've they've sort of got this hive mind. They've been in it for so long that they just kind of, you know, they're there ticking, making, letting things tick over and, and um, yeah, accepting a bit of business as usual kind of stuff. Whereas when we come in, come in with fresh eyes, with um, a real focus on our futures and, um, and, our potential children's futures you know you start thinking about like we can't leave this we have to leave these positions in a better state with the councils or the organizations in a better state than when we first came in so I feel like as an expecting mother I have even more motivation now to make sure that these challenges that the councils are going through with all the sort of you know, climate change, freshwater reform, resource management reform. We need people in council who are going to advocate for what's best for the future of our future generations. Um, and yeah, and I feel like before I got, I became hapu, I thought of the children who are here now 
Um, whereas now it's like even stronger because I have my own bun in the oven <laughs> um, that, yeah, I want to make sure that we're um, advocating for them, not just for the ratepayers of today. Uh, awesome perspective and um, it was really awesome hearing the um, young elected members at the um, conference sharing their um, karo. It was very, very inspiring. I feel quite, quite reassured with the future, really. Um, I guess one of the things that I've been really reflecting on a lot recently is that um, the structures that were created for local government through our legislation were created by men. And so there's so much of that that means that women and children have actually really been excluded. And it even goes back to how we um, are required to um, consult with our communities and the processes we go through and who we see coming to participate in that consultation. And you just realize that until you really start to address some of the, the basics around how we make our decisions and who we listen to and how we do that, um, you know, we're still working within a system that has been designed to work for men in their and their way of living and you know women actually have we do have we do have different needs and you know we ne we also um have a different approach which is also really valid and also brings some really um awesome uh, change to our community but i just think we're really seeing that um i guess the a lot of um things that get uh, we get pushback in council on um is people coming from the community from a different perspective is often around um, people sort of talk about lack of governance experience or, you know, we get that a little bit from our council, from people who have a perception that your CV needs to be flash and you need to have this degree or that degree or you need to have that experience. And actually we're really seeing, I've really seen it in this um, term even more so than last term, maybe with having more women and some young elected members as well, um, that actually that mould is really well and truly being broken and they're proving actually that um, there is so much power in that diversity. Kia ora. Kia ora. Uh, so when I was first um, elected, uh, so it was quite, it was a bit tricky because my husband and I were both elected and we were in a political minority. Um, so there were six positions and we were the two uh, lefties and then there were four people from um, communities and residents as they're called now, tr traditionally, um, not directly endorsed by national, but you know, lots of um, ex-national party MPs elected under that ticket and that kind of stuff. Um, and they had had a, a strong control of our community for, you know, 60 years basically um, and so it was very much a culture of small c conservative um, how can we keep rates as low as possible which local boards don't set rates but the ambition that you might have for your community um, really was influenced by that kind of mindset of you know basically let's do some feel good stuff for the community let's support them with some community grants and help um, run some events and stuff but basically our role is to um, keep local government quite small and contained, keep people who might um, feel differently about that out. And um, so there, there, Michael and I were with a, a newborn baby that we had to take to everything um, and a nearly three-year-old. And um, we were like, well, you know, local boards are new. This is a new opportunity, actually. Um, you know, let's really embrace this. Um, our local board had uh, three of us in our 30s at the time. That made us the youngest local board um, in Auckland. And um, it was actually one of the other 30-year-olds um, who basically expected that I would have no role um, because I was a woman and because I had children. Uh, and that obviously I was just there as a proxy for my husband. I was the second vote for him. I wasn't really a person in my own right. So that was quite challenging, and I had to deal with that for about six years, including three years while I was chairing the local board. Um, and there was just, you know, the the when local boards first started, nobody knew what they were doing. The organisation um, was very disorganised. We didn't even have um, rooms to meet in. Um, we were being paid well under what it turned out the um, hours were going to be. Uh, lots of people were doing it sort of as a hobby. Um, particularly people who'd been on the legacy councils and didn't realise um, that actually this is a profession, this is now a professional job, um, which is not to denigrate existing community boards at all. Um, but that was the mindset 
of those kinds of people. Uh, and so coming in from a sort of semi-professional background um, and having some vision about what could be achieved through local government was quite a challenge for some people to accept and particularly for that to come from a, a relatively young woman um, who had just, you know, who was breastfeeding at council meetings, which um, the people on the local board I was on were actually really supportive about that um, and really helpful about the fact I was bringing my baby and then subsequently the, the second, uh, the third child. Um, but other people in um, elected positions in other parts of the council really struggled with it um, and just like, I remember one guy from um, Waitakere, I think, um, who basically I, I would say something to him and he would just sort of look at me um, and it was kind of like, you know, I just said something. Wrong. <laughs> it's just, it was just like I just sort of wasn't really there. Um, yeah. So uh, Auckland Council's changed heaps. The diversity of people elected now is much, much better. Um, the acceptance of um, women and the acceptance of children. Um, I've done a lot of work around uh, trying to get more children's voice into decision-making in our area. So we now have children's panels. Um, and uh, yeah, but it's very different in different parts of Auckland. Uh, and a lot of that comes down to the culture of the local board. Are they looking to limit how much council does to keep rates down? Or are they looking to really um, make the most of the potential for people working together? Um, so that has a big bearing. And my perception is that um, particularly uh, women with children are more likely to fall into the latter camp and go, you know what, it should be really cool if we could do this or let's fix that so that in 10 years' time, you know, my kids have a better life. Um, I, I just wanted to add a few points. I think that um, the enormous pressure to preserve the status quo, um, which I had was unprepared for. And I think that um, the, the way that local government, I guess the fact that there's such a low voter turnout has really um, kept it uh, resistant to the change that we've seen in other kinds of politics. And um, so that diversity hasn't been there, but, but also there's a, a sort of a, an attempt to hold it and say, this is not politics, it's something else. It's just, you know, some sort of kind of management of the current resources in a way to keep things exactly as they are. Thank you very much. And I guess I'm really interested in that question, like how do you know who's a good candidate and who's not and who to vote for? And I, I, I've been thinking about that. And to me, there's kind of two sorts of really bad councillors who I would never want to vote for. And it's not about any kind of political ideology necessarily. It's about people that want to uh, simplify the problems and make you think there are easy solutions. So, you know, like, for example, in, in, in our city at the moment, it's falling down a hill, essentially, because of climate change, extreme rainfall, we're having massive slips. And there are a lot of people in the community echoed by some councillors and candidates who say, well, we've got to fix this and we've got to focus on this. And we can't do, you know, and not connecting it, for example, to climate change so as if we just put all our money into kind of almost literally ambulances at the bottom of hills and not think about the causes of how we got there so there's that kind of simple easy solutions yes you can have low rates in a really resilient city yes you can have you know these things um and then the other sort of bad counselor to me is the person that overcomplicates every situation and presents every problem with another problem you know so it's just almost a bait and switch so you know um that they you know we can't be solutions focused we are just raising more issues raising more issues and those two sorts of people i think because you end up not really standing for anything in local government with the way it's preserved itself with low turnout and low participation has it rewards that kind of um that turns into a career. And I think that is one of the problems that our cities and towns have faced is that inaction and bad decision-making are sort of in a safe place. Whereas bold decision-making future or, you know, faced uh, the actually being optimistic, uh, that those things are not rewarded. 
So, you know, I think that's something about, you know, what I would say to people listening now is those are red flags for me. Those people who are problem with another problem or it's all easy and you don't have to change anything. Okay, I'm going to try not to double up on what other people have said. Um, I would say that um, something that makes a good counsellor would definitely be somebody who's willing to learn and actually reads their agendas, which sounds dreadful, but you do get people who just kind of skim read the recommendation and maybe flick through the pages a wee bit. Um, and when they come to the debate, you think, have you read the same report as I have? Um, but also you've got to be willing to go and learn a wee bit more. I mean, I'm quite lucky that being on a smaller council, it's pretty much part time. So I've been very slowly doing some extra courses on the side. Once I realised just how much I didn't know about planning, for instance, which was something that really bugged me because that was something I was quite passionate about. But there's all this background inertia and the historical policies and the, the glacial pace of change in local government in general that but then combined with rapid legislative change, um, which is all really exciting and quite fascinating, frankly, I'm a bit, a bit too much of a geek. Um, but you kind of want to learn it so you can make some better decisions, because quite often, once you've made a decision, you don't get to go back on it. Like you, you can't discuss it again for several months. And most of the time you don't ever discuss it again at all. So if you don't raise it there and then you've you've got to be ready. Um, but I guess in terms of uh, being a woman and a mum we've definitely got a lot of different perspectives on certain things um, so there's four out of our 12 um, including the mayor are female um, I have to say two of us are in the 40s bracket the other two are in the 70s bracket um, so we've got even between the us it's not you know obviously just female um, but we're definitely thinking wider than our district so we are quite a small district we've got about 75,000 people but we're on the edge of a very large city um so you've got a a, a lot of my our colleagues um it does seem to be a bit of an us and them to a lot of people when it can't be we can't that's just really inefficient we can't do that um especially not in terms of the level of internal migration in New Zealand not just across you know local borders but across the country so when you're discussing things like spatial planning or three waters or anything else like that you've really got to remember that chances are your child or your grandchild or whatever else is going to be living somewhere else so you know your opposition to certain things for, on the basis of a local issue yes you've got to represent your local area but more than that you've got to represent their, the people's needs um, and that's going for the next 30 40 years not you know so decisions that affect the environment will affect people <laughs> as well um, I think that some of the hardest things that we've got is um, a lot of our councillors, our, our reports are very staff driven. Um, some of a lot of the committees, a lot of subcommittees were taken away this triennium because of people complained about feeling like they were a bit of an A and B team um, based on which portfolios they got and everything. So they were like, OK, let's converge everything. But that meant that no particular portfolio had a lead. Um, so I think there's quite a bit of stuff that has and COVID probably helped with that we were, weren't in council for a good portion of the time we spent a lot of time on Zoom um, and a lot of our senior staff have been in local government of one form or another for decades um, the legal advice that we're getting I was searching the guy who was giving us some relatively questionable like if I can pull questions out of the air and I'm not a lawyer um, to question somebody and he just goes because of xyz and i don't think it's relevant and then two days later you hear that your neighboring councillor has council has managed to do exactly what you asked even though apparently it wasn't legal <laughs> you know i looked him up and he's been giving our council advice for nearly 30 years so it's it's like the like rebecca said like the overwhelming um need to maintain business as usual is so frustrating sometimes and some of that for us as well i guess is um Selwyn is possibly national's safest seat um, in the whole of New Zealand. Um, I don't think it has ever not had a national MP. Um, and I'm not running as a Green, but I am a member of the Green Party. Um, and I sit next to a dairy farmer. So that's, you know, that's kind of fun. We agree on some things, a lot of things we absolutely disagree on, but you come in with totally different perspectives. Um, so I'm trying not to talk too much, but uh, somebody asked on the chat about mum skills. 
And I think communication is lacking for some people. I think a, a few of my colleagues um, seem to think that you get elected once every three years, and then because you got elected, you don't necessarily need to talk to anybody anymore um, because they must like you, otherwise you wouldn't have been elected. So that must just be blanket approval of all your thoughts. Um, and it was because, you know, we've got quite a young district as well. Uh, most people engage more on Facebook than they do with our township committees or residents associations. So if you're not there where our people actually are, then you're missing a whole wedge of the conversation. And Facebook, I'm sure everybody here knows, you know, you get a couple of people throwing an I heard or council did this or they're all a bunch of numpties. And next thing you know, you've got a flame war on your hands and it's it wasn't fun in the 90s and it's still not fun. <laughs> Um, aging myself there. Um, so yeah, it's, and I guess the other thing with mums, um, yes, somebody also mentioned about being caught in the street. Yes. And I don't mind that. I quite like being, having a chat in the supermarket or the library because it gives me an opportunity to talk with supermarket analogies or council facility analogies, you know, yeah, sure. This is what your rates pay for, you know, that sort of thing. Or yes, if you want me to cut rates, that's great. It'd be like buying the budget spaghetti this week, but at some point you still have to get the really nice stuff. Um, otherwise, you know, you come up with random analogies that seem to work a wee bit better, I feel like. And um, somebody else was asking about accessibility. We do have one person with a visual disability, um, but it doesn't seem to slow him down a great deal. Um, I am relatively sure that we have at least two people uh, on the autism spectrum around council, but that doesn't so it seem to slow any of us down. Um, in fact, I, well, it's going to be fair here. I think I'm one of them, to be honest, based on my children's diagnoses. But um, it would be interesting to have more diversity of any variety around our table. Um, age, we're getting there. Gender, we're getting there. Ethnicity, no. Nah. We have one Māori member, but he's not Manafenua. In fact, he clashes with our Manafenua. Um, and there's very little in the way of accessibility testing that's happening at all. Um, so that would be good. And but based on this year's run of candidates, I don't think we're going to get there either, sadly. Um, and I will shut up now because I think I've talk, spoken too much. <laughs> on to you, Amanda. <laughs> Sophie, it's awesome that you've had a chance to answer some of those questions too before you run away. So um, I want to jump to some of those other ones too. Um, uh, so thinking about what um, women and parents bring to the council table, um, parents, for in the case of district council, parents use a lot of the facilities more than other people do. We use the parks, we use the playgrounds, you use the footpaths, and you really quickly notice how accessible or inaccessible they are. Um, in fact, I've reported my neighbours for their overgrown trees because I had to take my foot, my my stroller out onto the foot, onto the road rather, and was like, "This is not cool." Um, but you become heaps more aware of the facilities that the council does it actually operate and can give feedback on them and understand the user experience a lot more. Um, I think as a as a couple of broad sweeping generalisations from my observation of what goes around goes on around our council table women do bring a really different perspective and often are and parents are more focused on uh, the future and making sure that our um our communities are prepared for that future and that um our children are provisioned for in the way that we um, develop our communities um and also more connected with people and different people's viewpoints um and this might be a bit cheeky to say, but also, you know, there seems to be a gender difference in um, the balance of capability versus co like confidence. So I notice in some of our male elected members, their confidence level um, is much higher than their capability level. And what tends to happen for women is that it's the opposite way around, you know? And I think um, some days I've felt like I'm not doing a good enough job because I'm operating at like 40%, you know, it's been a really tough night. The baby's been up six times and I'm like, I am not doing well. And I think, then I look at some of my other colleagues and I think, well, my 40% is better than their 100%. So like we're winning. And I would say the same to some people who are thinking about maybe running for council, but not feeling like they can really do that good a job because actually often you, you'd smash it. Um, 
yeah, so that's what I think uh, being a woman and, and a parent brings to the table. And I just want to sneak in an answer to that um, mum skills question, because I love that. Sorry for breaking the rules and jumping forward. But I totally um, agree with what Sophie said about involvement in the community. Women are involved, as, again, as a broad sweeping generalisation, a lot more involved in the community. You know, you go to volunteer groups and fundraising events and whatnot, and it's pretty much 90% women doing all of the job of holding our community together, right? And those networks are really valuable and important. Um, the skill of efficiency, they say studies have shown that um, the most efficient people in the workforce are working mums. They just, you just smash it out because you've got no choice, right? Um, multitasking, negotiation uh, is a big one, and a poker face. You know, when your kids are doing something that they really shouldn't and you're trying not to encourage them by laughing, um, that can come in really handy around the council table as well. That's so good. I have a terrible poker face, so I should probably work on that. <laughs> I think, um, yeah, possibly it comes across on Twitter sometimes. Um, hey, I just wanted to talk to two points. The first about um, kind of inclusion, diversity, and how we can bring more um, different perspectives and experiences into council. And then also the thing about um, that Rebecca mentioned about like politics shouldn't be in local government. Um, you know, I, I'm so incensed by that concept because I feel like it's such a privileged statement, right? If you can't find a home or you can't, you know, you can't afford um, to get to work every day or, you know, living is tricky for whatever reason. Politics is every day and it is local. And I think we draw up these invisible lines of, oh, um, that's actually a central government job and that's actually a Greater Wellington Regional Council job. And actually, if we just put people at the centre of that and what their experience is, none of those things matter whose responsibility it is, right? Um, and so, you know, thinking about bringing in different kinds of people and supporting them in this space, um, you know, to, to be honest, like I've had some people trying to intimidate me um, <laughs> Rebecca knows what I'm talking about. I see you nodding away there. Um, basically, to, yeah, to try and keep that kind of status quo. And I've got an incredible team around me. And the reason I have an incredible team, frankly, is because I'm standing, you know, with a party and I have that support system and that support network. And, you know, support for policy advice and um, just kind of moral support as well. But also the kind of party infrastructure like for the last three years I've been raising, you know, I've been working and I've been raising my kids. I haven't had time to go to community meetings and, and get my face known. Um, so to be honest, I would have no chance in hell if I didn't have the infrastructure of the party behind me and supporting me. Um, the other thing when I start, decided to run for council, I started looking into was what kinds of, um, I guess, input and engagement the Pacific community has with council. And I know we've got a really strong Pacific advisory board, um, which is great, but we've only ever had one Pacific Island councillor on Wellington City Council. And we actually do have quite a population of Pacific people living here. A lot of our people are driving our buses, are working in our supermarkets, working in our public sector, and they're just not represented. And, um, oh, thanks, Michelle. <laughs> Um, and look, it's um, it's actually, it, it blew me away. People have stood and they've not gotten in. And so, you know, appreciating that while I have the, the, both the privilege of a Pacific perspective and the privilege of white privilege, frankly, um, you know, I think I'm in a really unique position to be able to kind of go in there and almost Trojan horse a little bit, to be honest, and leave the gate open behind me. Um, but it has to be a safe space for people. When we are inviting people in, whether that be of different cultures, genders, whatever, um, often it's not a safe space for people to exist in. And so, you know, making that and allowing that. And, I, you know, I see the work that, that Jill and Rebecca and Laurie and some of our other colleagues, Tam and co, have, have really put in that effort to make it a place that of belonging and um yeah and I think 
that has to come first before we really start inviting people in and, and, and getting people on board. They have to have that support system as well. I think that's all I have to say. Awesome. That actually leads in amazingly well to something else that we wanted to sort of um, talk about. Uh, so what we might have to do, I'm just really conscious of our time here. So we might have to sort of go down to, because that one I think was one of our key questions. So I was really loved having everyone answer it. Um, but sort of for some of the other ones, we may look at just having a first couple of people answer it so we can cover a little bit more of the topics. Um, I also wanted to just flag now with our panel, um, hoping since we've got so many amazing questions here from our audience, that some of you might be willing to do some written questions after the fact. So I'll flag that now, plant a little seed and do let us know after the webinar if you would be happy to do that. Um, so as I was saying, what Luana talked about really leads into um, the question I was going to ask next, which is around, I guess we've talked a lot about representation, we've talked a lot about accessibility, and I guess I'm just curious on some perspectives of what the main barriers are to our councils being not very represent representative, which is where we're at currently, and sort of what supports, what support networks could councils or do individual candidates and councillors need to put in place in order to make council a safer space? Um, so yeah, Elvisa, kick us off. Yeah, so um, Amanda and I, as you know, Jen, um, we work quite closely on a lot of things. And so it's like we've found support in other councillors who are in similar boats as us. Um, as an expectant mother, financing my campaign this time has really um, challenged me to ask for help rather than being like fully community servant mode where you're just like yeah this is I'm going to put all my my money doesn't mean anything I don't really need it this time I'm like I kind of need my money this time um help like literally putting on Instagram on my private page like you know um somebody complained about our the letter sizing on our hoardings which means we have to pay $300 for stickers to increase the lettering on our hoardings that we recycled from last campaign you know there's all these extra costs that keep coming up and I don't have decades, we don't have decades of name recognition that these older people can just ride that wave and keep getting elected. And we don't have, you know, all these assets and savings that we can just sort of flick off when we need to get our name out there. So it's, that's a real struggle this time, um, financing the campaign and um, asking for help through fundraising, especially as I'm the main earner between me and my husband he's a student but also feeling the pressure as a young colored expectant mama feels like a big responsibility so there is a little bit of like pressure to feel like there's an emotional sort of I don't want to say baggage but there's definitely emotional pressure there um, and learn and because of that I feel like I have to learn how to speak the same language and find overlapping values and ideas with all those other different counsellors and that can be difficult especially when you have to deal with things like misogyny and ageism which do exist and they manifest in different ways so reaching out to my community and friends especially as I don't have family here they live in Tokoroa which is three and a half hours away Amanda's in a similar boat um, I'm sure she can add on to that but yeah, finding people in similar um, situations with similar kaupapa and leaning on them for emotional support and, and also sharing tips on how to cope and find solutions to these, um, to these struggles and challenges has been really helpful. And I feel very well supported. Um, and I got a really nice message from someone who donated $200 to my campaign because they can't be here. And they were like, I hope you can feel our aroha, even though some of us can't make it to your events. And I was like, oh, you know, um, moments like that really make it worth it. But it does mean that you kind of have to put yourself out there a little bit and, and be OK with being a bit vulnerable sometimes. Um, I, I guess this one is a little bit uh, tangible and I'm not sure whether this translates across the mutu, but here in Wellington, I was quite surprised to hear that in terms of support um, of staff at council, there's 
just correct me if I'm wrong, Rebecca and Joe, there's one support person to four-ish counsellors. Yeah. And, you know, when I think about the decisions that counsellors and the governance they're expected to do and the decisions that they have to make, no one can be an expert in all of these possible things, like of infrastructure, of transport, of housing. No one is an expert in all of those things that exist in the whole world. And so when we look at, say, the program that um, like our ministers of the Crown have, for example, they have entire offices um, you know, of people to support them in their policy decisions and in their decision making to make sure it's good quality decision making. And I'm really, I was quite amazed to hear that. Um, and so when you're trying to bring in different people and new people, um, there can possibly be, you know, a, a tension there because you have to get up to speed and learn all these things. And um, yeah, I, I'm really interested as to whether the local um, like local government reform coming up might start to address some of that, because I really think on a tangible level, there's not enough support from those subject matter experts kind of within the staff. You have your hand up, Jen, to, to tell us maybe that's enough speakers on this particular topic. I was getting myself in the line to do so. So I was going to say three on this one and then I was okay. going to jump in. So, okay, cool. um, uh, so uh, in regards to the question of how, what are the barriers to getting more diversity on council? I think it becomes a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. So if we're only seeing older people, if we're not seeing people who are parents, if we're not seeing women on our councils, people then don't identify and then don't feel like they can stand. Um, perpetuated by um, what was said earlier around the voting rates, you know, so um, across the country, I think the average voter turnout is about 40%. The 40% who do turn out do tend to be older, they tend to be whiter, and they tend to be more conservative and more wealthy and more likely to be homeowners, and then it, it kind of just repeats the cycle. So I think... Um, the last election around the country, we got way more diversity on lots of councils around the country. In New Plymouth, um, we went from, we've got a council of 15, we went from two women to four. We got one whole Māori member on our um, council, uh, which is more than for a long time before that. Um, and we dropped the median age by almost 20 years. So it was a massive shift. And I think what we've seen in the community is engagement from the community from a broader um, cross-section of our community, right? Because they can see that actually the council is looks like a bit more like me um, than it has before. And I hope that that continues to snowball. I'm not sure that it will. I think that this election, there's a different feeling in the air, um, but hopefully I'm proved wrong. Um, in terms, and also one of the other barriers is around pay. You know, councillors don't get paid a huge amount of money. At least it depends where you are in the country. In New Plymouth, we don't get paid a huge amount of money for the um, work we put in. And even worse for Alvisa on the regional council. Um, and that's a real barrier for people because actually a lot of people need to, um, if they were working already, they need to reduce those hours or stop that job altogether to be able to, um, for council in and for people who are younger and kind of in the middle of their careers and really wanting to establish themselves, that's a real um, barrier. In, term, in terms of support, I'm definitely having other people around the table and um, neighbouring councils has really helped me. I don't know what I would do um, without Alvisa and some of the other people who are on our council. Um, I've got three, three out of four of the women on our council are under 40. And um, so that's really helped and um, are really awesome people. Um, but for me, that hasn't really been enough. And one part of my struggle to decide to stand again in the upcoming election was um, having felt quite isolated through the term and feeling like um, I've been kind of a lone voice around my particular council table, particularly on the climate change issue. And I haven't done a good enough job of drawing on the support of my community um, during the term. I had lots of support. And getting into council and then a little bit at the beginning of the term but then it all kind of fell away and um, I think some friends have said they had a feeling of like oh but Amanda's in there now so I don't need to worry about pushing the council on climate change but actually one person or two people or even three people around the table 
pushing um, a co-papa like that is not enough. So it's really for me the focus this term is about is going to be about how to build that support outside of council as well to make sure that um, I uh, have enough emotional reserves and emotional energy to keep fighting the fight around the table because sometimes it really does feel like a fight. Um, but one that's worth it, you know, so that's why I'm putting my hat in the ring again. Uh, also, there's two practical support points. One is that um, this election we um, introduced um, childcare uh, uh, allowances, so up to $6,000 we can claim on childcare, um, and my council's been really supportive of jumping in and out and stuff with babies and Zooming instead of being in person and stuff, so that's really helped. Cool. Um, so I've just seen a comment from Jill in the chat about changing meeting times and sort of some of the stuff Amanda was talking about as well. Um, I'm sort of thinking about, so those are some of the things we can do to make it accessible for counsellors which is really important but I think they're also like an added bonus is that they make it more accessible for people who want you know people in the same positions who might want to come and speak at council or get involved in council in other ways so um I guess I'm hoping Jill might put her hand up to talk a bit about how we can be involved if we're not at the council table and how we can all sort of work together to make those processes more accessible as well. So it's not just about having councillors around the council, council table who are representative, but also having communities speak up that's a bit more representative. Because I know when I've spoken at council meetings, um, the people in the audience look like the people in the council. And so it's kind of that whole system is, I guess, perpetuating itself on both sides of the table. Um, that wasn't really a question, but hopefully you can take something from there. Definitely, and um, yeah, totally agree. And, and we've actually seen one of the great things with COVID is that we now have um, we now have Zoom. And actually, I've really noticed that a lot of our, I think I said, our public participants are actually choosing to um, Zoom because it means that they can do it from wherever they are. We actually had a, um, a beautiful group of school kids um, Zoom in the other day from their classroom, and it meant that it didn't have to turn into a really big you know, class trip, which would have made it next to impossible. Um, but the thing you really do notice at the council table is that um, when you have people come in who look different to what we normally see, everybody around the table does actually really stop and listen. But um, also back to what Amanda said um, about, you know, sometimes people can think, oh, it's great that person's there. They're going to like, they're going to lead that process. They're going to be the ones that do it. When you are just one of a small number of people or on your own, um, you really need people there behind you and, and, and compelling a, a group of people to see why it would be um, a good thing to do. And actually, when we um, when we were voting on our mana whenua seats in our Māori ward being established, we had a couple of people at our committee who were absolutely against the idea. They just were not having a bar of it. And through the process, they started to interact and listen. And then we had our public um, submissions on, I can't remember, I think it was the mana whenua seats. And um, we had this, uh, a man come and share with us his, his personal experience. And um, he was speaking in favour. And these particular um, councillors uh, said they asked him um, what had what had made him, you know, change his approach in the way that he was working with Māori. And he said, "I saw my privilege." And so he shared something with people who felt they they could uh, they could uh, identify with him. And we, it was it was one of those moments where I saw a real change happen around our table. And they ended up supporting it. Have to say that there's still a bit of work to happen behind that to make sure that these things are solid. But I guess what it says is you can't underestimate the importance of that participation. And sometimes you don't necessarily feel it when you're the one participating as a public participant. You might not necessarily know the impact you're having, but you are. And so I think if I could just do anything is to say, if you have any even slight little bit of interest in a council co-papa, just take that time to do it. It's only a few minutes and um, it really is appreciated by the people around the table who who do, you know, at times we cop a lot of flack when we're really pushing some issues that are quite controversial. Um, you know, Wellington City Council, we're going to need lots of public participants about cycling because we are getting so much pushback and it's not just Wellington, I know, but um, we just, we really do need the voices from the community coming forward. Thank you. I think I might be next. Let's find out. 
Okay. Uh, so um, I think just to Totoko, um, Jill's point there about letting people know when you agree with something, because we get so much feedback that's negative and um, is saying, don't do this. And again, that goes to Rebecca's point about maintaining the status quo. Um, you know, one of the things with the low participation rate in the elections, which in Auckland's usually between sort of 30 to 35 percent, is that um, little things can have quite a big outsized impact on the result of the election. Um, so we had a situation last term where we had um, last election where we had a guy running um, who basically lied about where he lived. And that got it he, prior to um, that being exposed, um, there was some polling done, which is unusual, um, but there was some polling done which showed that um, he and um, an incumbent were running pretty much neck and neck. After that was exposed, he went down the tubes. So um, there can often be, you know, and I'm not saying it was good that he lied about where he lived, it definitely wasn't, um, and he wasn't on my team, but um, you know, things like that can really throw the conversation um, quite late in the piece and you just can't be prepared for that. So um, being able to, to know that you've got lots of people who, who um, support you and um, want change, but want positive change <laughs> instead of, um, you know, let's keep rates artificially low, which is the reason that Auckland Council's in the, in the financial position it's in. You know, people will talk about it being um, you know, a secret. It's not a secret, it's being on the front page of the paper. You know, we all know um, that financially Auckland Council is in a, a really tough spot, um, but we're not going to get out of it by keeping rates artificially low and doing less, um, because that's what that means, um, particularly on climate action, which is just so urgent. So if you do um, care about climate action, you know, even if you just tweet um, one of your local reps every once in a while, maybe even put it in your diary once a month, I'm going to send something nice to um, a local government rep in my area who I support and who I think is doing something something good because um, we don't get that many of those messages. We get a lot of messages telling us we're, um, as you said, as chocolate teapots, which happened to me last week. So um, you've got to have a really good support crew and a really um, staunch belief in yourself and know that you're connected to your community and that you're not wrong <laughs> to survive. Yeah. Kia ora. Jen, if you want to, do you want to go ahead of me and ask another question? <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. Um, I was, uh, I guess I wanted to say the same thing, but in a different way that, you know, in the chat, we were talking about imposter syndrome. And, you know, I definitely feel getting elected. Um, I'm just consumed with self-doubt and anxiety about am I doing the right thing? Am I saying the right thing? Am I embarrassing myself? If I get a troll, I earn away. I'm like looking, oh, maybe they're right. Maybe I was. <laughs> it was terrible. That's, and I think for, for many of us, that's kind of what we, what we do and how we think. And I tend to take the negative and put it in my pocket and carry it around with me forever. And but the what has made the difference for me to be able to do it and be able to stay and is the amazing love and support I have had from so many different people in the community. For me, that that is largely been on Twitter, which is weird. I know Twitter can be not great, but um it's but also, you know, when I think um I was door knocking with someone on on Sunday who you know, she sent me a message about like what a great job I've been doing at a, such a low point. And I was saying, I was like in tears about it. This is terrible. And, you know, I think maybe after I finish this, depending on what I need to do with my life, I might just become a professional cheerleader for um, especially elected women. And just kind of, you know, they're those bots which kind of give compliments. I want to be that, that bot. Um, and also, you know, shout out to Alicia, who's, you know, one of the organisers here. But I remember one of the moments I had after I talked in a council meeting, she tweeted what I said. And I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> you know, and it was like, and I think, you know, that kind of reason. And, and I've tried to do the same to members of the community that come in and talk to us, to encourage them, to amplify their voices, to, you know, we had a great person come from um, 
is it Ikaru about the about the upcycled you know e-bikes a solar moment she just she came up to me and she said I know you didn't say anything but you were just giving me this warm face while I was talking <laughs> so it's like making and you know it goes back to what Luana said previously about us changing it up to welcome people support them you know who's our city for and why and how do we open that up and um so I just want to you know thank you to everybody who's done that for me and if anybody's watching this maybe is the time to go and see support of music to someone. I really love that just how simple it can be to like give support because I think sometimes you can think that you got to do something really big to be a part of it but I, I just loved hearing that Alicia tweeting something you said is enough to sort of give you that little warm and fuzzy so that is yeah an amazing little insight um so I am aware we have come to the end of the time we have or not quite the end of the time but getting close and I think we could do this for so many more hours but time is precious and so we are not going to run over time um but what I did want to do um, is just have one quick fire round. So you're going to have to really keep it under the minute for like really brief little little slogan sort of things we're looking at. Um, and for this quick fire round, I am going to ask, why should people care about local government and get out and vote in whenever, next month? So if you all put your hands up, we'll get you in order and just do a quick fire round along and then we will be finishing up. Cool. So Elvisa, go for it. Um, I'm stealing this quote um, from Chloe Swarbrick, but uh, <laughs> she said, even if you don't engage with the system, the system engages with you. So that's pretty much my key message there. <laughs> Uh, so I think for me, it's um, the very real impact that local government has on everyone's daily life. You know, you flush your toilet, that's local government. Um, you walk up the road to the dairy, that's local government and your footpaths and your roads. It's just everywhere. It's the restaurants you go to, um, keeping them safe so that they don't um, kill you with food poisoning. You know, it's, it's actually literally everywhere in our daily lives. So why wouldn't you want to have a say in that? It's also the place where we can really make a difference on climate action. Um, so that's me. Um. I'll make it really quick by just saying ditto to what Julie said. You know, it, local government's got a huge impact on our daily lives um, and you should have a say. If not for you, then for your kids. Um, so local government can be a slow moving beast. Um, sometimes it can be quite hard to get things on the agenda, but once you figure it out, um, you can actually enact some quite big change. Um, but you do need to always remember, and the community also needs to remember that it is, it is unfortunately a numbers game. And so you do really need to um, work together and to build relationships. So people who are getting involved in local government standing for it, or just wanting to support people, think about how you can help to build teams, because actually that's what it's about. Shoulder. Um, I'd just like to say in a little bit of a um, selfishly possibly, but look, there's some incredible people stand, putting their, their hands up. Um, these incredible wahine, obviously, um, and, and lots of people like myself putting our hands up for the first time. And it's really flippin' scary and expensive and exhausting and all of the things. And um, if, you know, the least you can do is, is, is get out and vote. So um, that's, my, that's my point. Kia ora. I'm going to do another quote, and um, it's going to be a Jane Jacobs one. Uh, cities, and I'll go and towns and districts and regions, whatever, have the capability of providing something for everybody only because and only when they are created by everybody. I love that. I love all of those. I think it's so cool to have um, just those 
little insights into how it works and um, how we can, I guess, just really inspire people that it's not about a duty to vote. It's about caring about our cities. It's about caring where we live and caring about our families. And that's really what it comes down to when it comes to voting and engaging with local government. So we have three minutes left. Um, so I did want to, I suppose, apologize that we didn't get through to all of the questions. I really felt like the conversations and the things that our panelists had to share were so amazing um, that we didn't want to constrain it too much. But what I'm hoping that our panelists might do is give a little thumbs up and we might be able to send out some written questions to people after the case. We have got like the chat recorded, we've got the video recorded. So we can, um, yeah, we can collect some of those questions and give out for a, um, a written little thing. We've got an email addresses rather of all the people who've registered so we can communicate with you that way. And we can also share some of those on our Facebook or social media pages so that we can yeah I guess keep this all going because it's been a really lovely conversation I've really enjoyed having people from different places um yeah just different people talking about it and just really caring I think because you can come you know in daily life you can come across a lot of people who are really grumpy and have kind of given up caring but for the sake of our kids we really need to care and we need to vote for people who care and we need to come together and as Jill said we need to build teams and we need to make it you know that kind of um together and focusing and that's what parents for climate is really about and that's what you guys are about and I think it's just been a really nice sort of um relationship between what we stand for what you guys stand for and just seeing what we can sort of do together at the council table next to the council table coming into council I'm just going to quickly look in the chat if there's anything I've missed before we say, before we leave. Alicia, did you want to jump on and say anything quickly? No, apart from no? that, thank you for like facilitating an amazing, amazing, I, I feel like we could talk about this for hours. Like, I, I love me a good rant. <laughs> 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 Just paint some awesome reds. And ironically, my kids haven't come and interrupted. So, yeah. Thanks, Jen. Cool. Well, thank you so much to all our panelists. Thank you to everyone who came along and watched. And thank you to everyone who's going to get out there and vote and stand up for their community over the next months as these conversations start ramping up and can sometimes be a little bit challenging. Cool. Kakite, thank you everyone. That was great. I wish our residents, all our meetings would be like this during the hundred percent. Yeah, thank you so much, Jen, for organizing and everyone for being here, man. This has been awesome. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.